I'd like you to turn with me in your Bibles to Job 13. Job 13, I've titled a message this morning, Ashes and Clay. Ashes and Clay. And I realize that there's a lot of scripture verses on the screen that we will be referencing. We will not be turning to every single one of those. Uh, if you've got a pen and paper, I invite you to write some of those down. The ones that we don't directly go to, write those down, look them up later. Uh, but I've only got a, a handful that we will be looking at directly, and then the other ones you can write them down and look them up on your own. Uh, ashes and clay. The, the reality is, you and me are nothing more than ashes. You and me are nothing more than clay. Go back to the creation. God created man out of what? Dust. Out of the dust of the earth, God formed man. Out of the clay of the earth, he formed man, breathed into him the breath of life, and man became a living being. God's revelation of himself is seen throughout the entirety of Scripture. Folks who say that, that they are New Testament Christians, I get where they're coming from, I get what they're trying to communicate, but it's disingenuous. Because you cannot have the New Testament without the Old. I would prefer for us to say that we are whole Bible Christians. I would prefer for us to let it sink into our hearts and recognize that we are whole Bible Christians. Because what is this book right here? This book, summarized in one sentence, is the seamless is the single seamless storyline of salvation. From beginning to end, it talks about God's revelation of Himself. From beginning to end, it points to the salvation that you and me have in Christ Jesus. Turn with me to Psalm 19, the first three verses. Psalm 19 and verse 1, this is to the chief musician, it is a psalm of David. The heavens declare the glory of God, and the firmament showeth his handiwork. Day unto day uttered speech, and night unto night showeth knowledge. There is no speech nor knowledge where their voice is not heard. We have here in Psalm 19, the same thing that we see in Romans 1. We see both general and special revelation working together. It says the heavens declare the glory of God. You and me cannot look out into God's creation and deny His existence. Even the atheists, even those who hold to evolutionary theory, if you press them far enough, they will have to admit that there's some unseen power. There is some intelligent designer behind all of this. They may not be able to bring themselves to call <coughs> that intelligent designer God or Yahweh, but at some point, if you press them far enough and hard enough, they will have to admit that there is something more to this than just happenstance and accident. The heavens declare the glory of God, and the firmament showeth His handiwork. Day to day uttered speech, and night unto night showeth knowledge. There is no speech nor language where their voice is not heard. General revelation will not bring you and me to salvation. General revelation will not bring you and me to the truth of the gospel. General revelation will not bring you and me to the place of acknowledging Jesus as Lord. It's only when we hear the message of the gospel. It's only when we hear the bad news of our sin and the good news of our Savior that we are able to acknowledge Him as Lord in confession and repentance. We have four points in these 25 verses this morning. We see a rebuke for those speaking for God. We see a great statement of faith. We see that God is our salvation. And we see answered prayer. Let's look at the first ten verses from Job 13. Job chapter 13, the first ten verses. 
Lo, mine eye hath seen all this, mine ear hath heard and understood it. What ye know, the same do I know also. I am not inferior unto you. Surely I would speak to the Almighty, and I desire to reason with God. But ye are forgers of lies. Ye are all physicians of no value. Oh, that ye would all together hold your peace, and it would be your wisdom, and it should be your wisdom. Hear now my reasoning, and hearken to the pleadings of my lips. Will ye speak wickedly for God, and talk deceit, deceitfully for Him? Will ye accept His person? Will ye contend for God? Is it good that He should search you out? Or as one man mocketh another, do ye also do ye so mock him? He will surely reprove you if ye do secretly accept persons. Lord Jesus, we thank you for this, your word. We thank you that even in the midst of being attacked by these alleged friends, even in the face of false accusations, that this man Job shows wisdom, he shows insight, he shows a trust in you, in your kingship, and in your lordship. Lord, we pray that our faithfulness would exceed His. For we have what He did not have. We have Your full, Your complete revelation. We have the promises kept that He only anticipated. Lord, may we recall, may we remember that we are but ashes, that we are but clay, that you are the potter, that you are the one that have us on the potter's will, and you are fashioning us according to your will, and according to your glory. In your name we pray. Amen. What are we looking at here? Job is... Chapter 12, as we looked at last week, in chapter 13, as we're looking at this week, and as John will share with us next week in chapter 14, Job is responding to these three friends. Job is responding to Bildad, Eliphaz, and Zophar. He's responding to men who have misdiagnosed him. And he says what? He says that he knows all the truth that they presented to him. He knows everything that they know. He knows everything that they tried to confront him with. But he says, you've misdiagnosed me. It's as if he went to the doctor with cancer, and the doctor's trying to treat him for the flu. Imagine how that's going to work out. Imagine going to the doctor, you've got a serious illness, You've got a terminal disease, and, he's, and the doctor is treating you as if you've got something lesser. That's what these friends have done. They have misdiagnosed Job. The thing is, though, in the case of Job, it's not a cancer, but it is the flu. And they're treating the flu as if it's cancer. Job says, you misdiagnosed me. You don't know what, what you're talking about. You've spoken in very general terms, but you've not spoken to my specific situation. You've not spoken to what God is doing in my life and why God's doing this in my life. So Job appeals directly to God. Remember, Job is speaking. Job is living in the patriarchal period. Job's living properly during the life of Jacob. He has none of God's written word. He only has the oral tradition. 
And you'll recall that in the Old Testament, when Moses came along and began, God began declaring <laughs> and, and having Moses write down and having those after Moses write down God's revelation, that the priesthood was established. That men could not just go to God on their own, but they went through the mediator, through the priest. Job is crying out to appeal directly to God. Job is not looking to go through Zophar. He's not looking to go through Bildad. He's not looking to go through Eliphaz. But he's rather wanting to go directly to God. He's wanting to place himself at the mercy of God. We don't hear much contemporary preaching that deals with God's grace and mercy in the Old Testament. But we look at this man Job and we see God's grace and mercy at work. We look at books like Jonah and we see God's grace and mercy at work. God sending one of his prophets, not to his own people, but to the Gentiles, to the Ninevites. Calling them to confession, calling them to repentance. The Old Testament is chalked full of instances in which God declares His grace and His mercy. It is insufficient. It is wrong for you and me to say that the Old Testament is strictly law and the New Testament is strictly grace. The entirety of the Scriptures shows God's grace. When Adam fell and tried to hide himself, Adam deserved God's wrath. Adam deserved to be annihilated from the face of the earth. God chose instead to extend mercy. God chose instead to cover Adam with animal skins. When all of his creation was caught up eating, drinking, marrying, giving in marriage, in the days of Noah, God would have been within his rights because Noah was not a perfect individual. Noah, like everybody else, was a sinner. Noah, Noah could have been annihilated with everybody else, but God chose Noah out from the rest of creation to save him, extending grace to him, <coughs> and displaying mercy upon him. Proverbs chapter 17, verses 27 and 28. Proverbs 17, verses 27 and 28. <clears throat> Solomon writes, He that hath knowledge spareth his words, and a man of understanding is of an excellent spirit. Even a fool... <laughs> When he holdeth his peace, is counted wise. And he that shutteth his lips is esteemed a man of understanding. What's Solomon saying here? He that hath knowledge spareth his word. These three friends, these three supposed friends of Job, they didn't spare their words. But rather they came in judgment. They came in accusation. They came to tear Job down. They came not sparing their words, but they came filling up their words, showing themselves to be fools. It says, even a fool, when he holdeth his peace, is counted wise. These men presumed themselves to be wise. They presented themselves to be wise, but they were proven to be fools. Because they did not diagnose Job properly. These friends, they were talking deceitfully, and they were talking in the name of God. And guess what? When you and me talk in the name of God, deceitfully, when you and me try to bring Him in to our notions, God will judge us. What does the Scripture say is the criterion for a prophet? If what he says comes to pass, 
he's a true prophet. What he says doesn't come to pass, he's a false prophet. These three men are proven to be false prophets. They're blaspheming against God. Matthew chapter 12. What exactly is blasphemy? Matthew 12, and we'll read 22 through 32. Then was brought unto him one possessed of a devil, blind and dumb, and he healed him, <coughs> insomuch that the blind and dumb both spake and saw. And all the people were amazed and said, Is not this the son of David? But when the Pharisees heard it, they said, This fellow doth not cast out devils, but by Beelzebub, the prince of the devils. And Jesus knew their thoughts and said to them, Every kingdom divided against itself is brought to desolation. Every city or house divided against itself shall not stand. And if Satan cast out Satan, he is divided against himself. How shall, how shall then his kingdom stand? And if I, by Beelzebub, cast out devils, by whom do your children cast them out? Therefore, they shall be your judges. And if I cast out devils by the Spirit of God, then the kingdom of God is come unto you. Or else... How can one enter a strong man's house and spoil his goods, except he first bind the strong man, and then he will spoil his house? He that is not with me is against me, and he that gathereth not with me scattereth abroad. Wherefore I say unto you, all manner of sin and blasphemy shall be forgiven unto men, but the blasphemy against the Holy Ghost shall not be forgiven unto men. And whosoever speaketh a word against the Son of Man, it shall be forgiven him. But whosoever speaketh against the Holy Ghost, it shall not be forgiven him. Neither in this world, neither in the world to come. Blasphemy of the Holy Ghost. What is that? That is attributing to God that, that which is Satan, or attributing to Satan that which is God's. These men were claiming that Job brought this upon himself because of some gross, some blatant sin. And they were saying that Job was in need of confession and repentance, of moral failure. The religious leaders of Jesus' day, they were attributing to Satan that which was of God's work. This man was brought to Jesus he was blind, he was mute. Jesus healed him. Well, he did this by the power of bills, but Jesus simply says, a kingdom divided against itself cannot stand. They were attributing to Satan that which was God's work, just as the, the friends of Job were attributing to Job that which was, and Satan, that which was God's work. <clears throat> But then we see in 11 through 15, Job makes a great statement of faith. A great statement of faith. Shall not his excellency make you afraid, and his dread fall upon you? Your remembrances are like unto ashes, your bodies to bodies of clay. Hold your peace. Let me alone, that I may speak, and let come on me what will. Wherefore do I take my flesh and my teeth, and put my life in my hand? We won't get into verse 15 yet. But what's Job talking about here? These friends, these folks who have known Job, have become strangers. They, they're no longer friends, but rather they are strangers. They are not doing him good, but they are doing him evil. They are not diagnosing him, but they are misdiagnosing him. It's as if they don't even know the man to whom they speak. It's as if they don't even know the life of the one who's right there in their midst. And Job desires to stand before
for the God of the universe. Pleading his case directly to God. Because they're not speaking to him. He desires to speak to God directly. But guess what? When you and me stand before God, the very God of the universe, there's only one plea. And that's guilty. Because every single one of us stand guilty before God. I got an email from the camp last night about it. About one of the camp trustees that just passed away. He was just shy of 60 years old. 57 years old. If I can't do my calculations correctly. And I was reading the obituary and I recognized the names of the name of one of his sons, and so I, I shot, shot that young man a message on Facebook early this morning, saying that we, we would be praying for him. And on, on that young man's website, he described himself as a wretched sinner saved by grace. Mm -hmm. That's what we are. If we are honest with ourselves... We only stand before God able to plead guilty, able to plead that we are wretched, wretched sinners. There's nothing good within us. There's no one righteous, no, not one. There's none that does good, no, not one. We stand guilty, but the good news is that Christ Jesus paid the price for your guilt. And He calls upon you to cast yourself at His mercy. Cast yourself at His mercy. We won't take time to turn there, but write it down if you will. 1 Samuel chapter 28, verses 3-25. through 25, We see the, the king Saul. Saul was the king right before David. Saul was the king of the Israelites choosing. You recall that Israel desired a king. They desired to be like the nations around them. The other, the other nations around them had kings. They wanted a king. God said, okay, choose from among yourselves a king. So who did they choose? They chose Saul because he stood head and shoulders. He looked the part. But it wasn't long before he, it was revealed that he didn't act the part. He didn't live the part. God's favor was removed from Saul, and Saul realized it. Israel was going to battle. The prophet Samuel was dead. The spirit had departed from Saul. Saul needed to hear a prophetic word. So what did Saul do? Saul went to a woman who divine spirits. A woman who spoke with familiar spirits. The witch of Endor. And in going to the witch of Endor... God worked a miracle and allowed Samuel. God used Saul's sin to address Saul's sin. Saul desired to hear a prophetic word. Saul wanted to hear from someone of Samuel's stature, someone of Samuel's standing. And God worked through evil means to accomplish His will in rebuking Saul and saying that you're going to fall by the sword. You're going to fall by this foreign army. Psalm 119. Psalm 119 verses 105 to 112. Says, Thy word is a lamp unto my feet and a light into my path. I have sworn and I will perform it, that I will keep thy righteous judgments. I am afflicted very much. Quicken me, O Lord, according to thy word. Accept, I beseech thee, the free will offerings of my mouth, O Lord, and teach me thy judgments. My soul is continually in my hand. 
Yet do I not forget thy law. The wicked have laid a snare for me, yet I erred not from my precepts, not from thy precepts. Thy testimonies have I taken as an heritage forever, for they are the rejoicing of my heart. I have inclined my heart to perform thy statutes always, even unto the end. What is the word of God? The word of God is a lamp unto your feet. It's a light unto your path. You don't need a medium. You don't need a person who discerns familiar, from familiar spirits. You need the word of God. The word of God is sufficient for all of life and godliness. Proverbs chapter 14, verse 32. It says, The wicked is driven away in his wickedness, but the righteous hath hope in his death. The word is a lamp to your feet, a light to your path. Why? Because in it we find that the wicked are driven away in wickedness, and the righteous have hope even in death. Our hope is not in us, but our hope is in God Almighty. Let's look back where we left off, verse 15. What does Job say? He makes, a, he makes that great statement of faith. A statement of faith that would make sense if you and me were speaking it from this side of the cross, but Job makes a statement of faith as he looks to the promises that are being made, as he looks in anticipation for the fulfillment of those promises, he says, Though he slay me, yet will I trust in him, but I will maintain my own ways before him. Even though Job may die, even though this infirmity, the, these boils that he's scraping off with a piece, piece of pottery, may take his life, Job says that he will trust in God Almighty. Can you say that? Can you trust, do you trust, in God Almighty to get you through the situation? Even if he should slay you, even if your current situation should take your life, will you continue to trust him? I constantly am reminded of a man by the name of Leland Larson. He was a member of Meadow Hill Baptist Church back in the late 90s and early 2000s. He was diagnosed with a brain tumor. Just months before that cancer took his life, he was at the doctor for a checkup. <clears throat> doctor said, Leland, how you doing? You know what the words out of his mouth were? I'm blessed. He had an inoperable brain tumor, advanced cancer, months from death, and he was able to say, I'm blessed. Though he slay me, yet will I trust in him. How far does your trust go? Is your trust just in the ashes and clay that are your life? Or is your trust Beyond this life. Is your trust that he will get you through this situation. And give you a better life here and now. Or is your trust that even if he chooses not to get you through your current situation. That you will still trust in him. Knowing that he has your back. Knowing that he has your best interest at heart. Knowing that all things work together for the good of those who love him, for those who are the called according to Christ Jesus. They don't want you to see that God is our salvation. God is our salvation. Verse 16. He also shall be my salvation. For an hypocrite shall not come before him. Hear diligently my speech, my declaration with your ears. Behold now, I have ordered my cause. I know that I shall be justified. Remember, Job is an Old Testament saint. 
<clears throat> he has just a glimmer of the life that you and me have. But make no mistake about it. The Old Testament and the New Testament are one revelation. It's not one revelation in the Old Testament and another in the New. It's not one revelation for Job and another for you. It's one revelation. Jesus is that one revelation. Everything from Genesis to Malachi paints the picture of Jesus. Even down to when Moses would give the orders for the tabernacle. And when Solomon would give the orders for the temple. The details of those structures painted the picture for Jesus. Every single detail in, from Genesis to Malachi pointed to Jesus. It is one revelation. Matthew 23, we won't take time to turn there. But there are eight times in that one chapter. Jesus is talking to the religious rulers. And what does he say? He doesn't say blessed. He doesn't say, well done, thou good and faithful servant. But eight times in Matthew chapter 23, he says to the religious, woe, woe, woe. Whoa, 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 and whoa. Eight different times he calls them out for their sin. He calls them out for their unrighteousness. He calls them out for their hypocrisy. God is our salvation. Turn with me to Romans chapter 3. Why did they need to be called out for their hypocrisy, for their unrighteousness, for their sin? Why did they need to be called out for their false pretenses? Because they didn't understand the truth of Scripture. They didn't understand the reason for the sacrificial law. They didn't understand the reason for the sacrificial system. Everything from Adam to Moses... And then from Moses to Jesus, pointed to the truth that we see here in Romans chapter 3, verse 23. For all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. Every single one of us are sinners. There's not a single one of us who get through this life sinless. From the moment you're conceived to the moment you die... You are a sinner. What does Romans chapter 5 verse 8 say? But. That little conjunction, but. When we see it in scripture. It's always followed by something profound. Something that we can take to the bank with us. But God commended his love toward us in that. While we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. When did Christ die for you? When you were yet a sinner. The best way I can describe it, when you were in the very middle of the worst act, the worst sin you've ever committed, that's when Jesus died for you. He commended his love toward us, and that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. For us. Romans 6.23 For the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. We know we're sinners. We know that Christ died for you when you were in the midst of the worst sin you've ever committed. We know that the wages of that sin deserve death, but the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. Romans 10, verses 9 and 10. Then if thou shalt confess with thy mouth the Lord Jesus, and shalt believe in thine heart that God hath raised him from the dead, thou shalt be saved. For with the heart man believeth unto righteousness, and with the mouth confession is made unto salvation. 
It's not enough to just recognize your sin, but you must acknowledge Jesus as Lord. <coughs> it's not enough to just recognize that you are a sinner, but you need to confess that sin. What is confession? Confession is saying the same thing about your sin that God says about it. What does God say about it? God says that it deserves death, it deserves damnation. So if God is our salvation, then what's the result? Once we come to Jesus acknowledging Him as Lord, once we come to Jesus in confession and repentance, guess what? We have answered prayer. See, an unbeliever doesn't get his prayers heard. An unbeliever can, can talk all day, can, can make an attempt to raise prayers to God, but only a <coughs> believer will actually have his prayers heard. Only a believer will actually have his prayers answered. Verse 13 of chapter 13 in Job. Wait, no, that didn't make sense. <coughs> Read verse 19 in chapter 13 of Job. Job 13, verse 19. Who is he that will plead with me? For now, if I hold my tongue, I shall give up the ghost. Only do not two things unto me. Then will I not hide myself from thee. Withdraw thy hand far from me, and let not thy dread make me afraid. Then call thou, and I will answer. Or let me speak, and answer thou me. How many are mine iniquities and sins? Make me to know my transgression and my sin. Wherefore hidest thou thy face, and holdest me for thine en enemy? Wilt thou break a leaf driven to and fro, and wilt thou pursue the dry stubble? For thou writest bitter things against me, and makest me possess the iniquities of my youth. Thou puttest my feet also in the stocks, and lookest narrowly unto all my paths. Thou settest a print upon the heels of my feet, and he, as a rotten thing, consumeth as a garment that is moth-eaten. What is the purpose of prayer? What is the primary purpose of prayer? We often see billboards and bumper circuits that say, prayer changes things. Does it? Does prayer really change things? Does prayer change what God has already decreed He wants to do? No. Prayer doesn't change anything. If God desires for one outcome, then you and me praying otherwise is not going to change that outcome. What prayer changes is you and me. What prayer changes is our hearts. What prayer changes is our perspective. You and me oftentimes come to, come to God in prayer. We see a situation. We experience a situation. We, we have a moment in our lives in which we stand in need and we... Because we are finite individuals, think, well, this is what needs to be done in answer to this situation. So we come to God with our preconceived notion of what He needs to do to answer our prayer. Prayer doesn't change the situation. Prayer changes you and me. Prayer doesn't change the outcome. It changes your perspective. The primary purpose of prayer is to change us. When our hearts are changed through prayer, then we acknowledge that prayer is answered when God says, No, I'm not going to heal this. I'm not going to restore this. I'm not going to do this. Or when God says, Not yet. Prayer changes you and me. Prayer molds and shapes our hearts bends our hearts toward the will of Almighty God. So that you and I recognize that promise in Romans 8, 28. That we know that all things work together for the good of them that love God, for those who are the called according to His purpose. 
Job saw no, no point to his suffering. <clears throat> Job recognized, as we saw in Job chapter 1, he was perfect, he was upright, he feared God, he eschewed evil, he saw no point to this suffering. But he cried out to God. <clears throat> he cried out to God to give an answer. He cried out to God so that he could get a better sight of this glimmer of light that he was already seeing. Isaiah chapter 50. Isaiah chapter 50 verses 40. Isaiah 50 verses 4 through 9. The Lord God hath given me the tongue of the learned that I should know how to speak a word in season to him that is weary. He wakeneth my morning. He wakeneth morning by morning. He wakeneth my ear to hear as the learned. The Lord God hath opened my ear and I was not rebellious. Neither turned away back. I gave my back to the smiters and my cheeks to them that plucked off the hair. I hid up my face from shame and spitting. For the Lord God will help me, therefore shall I not be confounded. Therefore have I set my face like a flint, and I know that I shall not be ashamed. He is near that justifieth me. Who will contend with me? Let us stand together. Who is my adversary? Let him come near to me. Behold, the Lord God will help me. Who is he that shall condemn me? Lo, they all shall wax old as a garment. The moth shall eat them up. What's Isaiah saying? The Lord's given me the tongue of the learned. That I shall speak. He waketh me. The Lord opened my ear. I was not rebellious. Neither turned away back. In prayer, the prophet recognized that God was shaping him, molding him, bending him toward God's perfect will. Psalm 39, verse 7 to 11. And now, Lord, what I wait for, my hope is in thee. Deliver me from all my transgressions. Make me not the reproach of the foolish. I was dumb. I opened not my mouth because I dissed it. Remove thy stroke away from me. I am consumed by the blow of thy hand. When thou with rebukes dost correct my man for iniquity, thou makest his beauty to consume away like a moth. Surely every man is vanity. <coughs> what's, the, what's the psalmist saying here? He says, remove this sin from me. Remove this iniquity. Correct me. Change me. He says, because I am vain. In our sinfulness, in our unregenerate state, we are nothing but vain. Our attention is always on ourselves, and it's only when we come to God in salvation that our attention is taken off of ourselves and put on our Creator. Don't turn there, but, but you can write down Deuteronomy 32, verses 19 through 22. And I'll bring your attention also to Psalm 13, verse 1. How long, O Lord, will you forget me for good? How long will you hide your face from me? The Lord doesn't hide His face from His elect. The Lord doesn't hide His face from His sons and daughters. There may be times when we feel that way. There may be seasons of life when we're going through a mess. And it just seems like everything is crashing in all at once, just like with Job. There may be seasons when the only prayer that we can pray is, How long will you forget me? How long will you... Hide your face from me. But also look at Psalm 44, verse 24. Why do you hide your face and forget our affliction and our oppression? The psalmist knew, both in 13 and in 44, that there are times in life when it feels like God is far from us. 
The psalmist knew that there are times in our lives when it feels like God is hiding himself from us. It's not unique to you, it's not unique to me to feel abandoned by God. It's not unique to Job to feel abandoned by God. It's not unique to Job to be sitting on an ash heap, scraping boils off with a piece of pottery. It's not unique to Job to be attacked, to be falsely accused by so-called friends. It's not unique to Job to want to speak to God directly. Psalm 88, verse 14. O oh Lord... Why do you cast away my soul? Why do you hide your face from me? In those moments, when we identify with Job, in those moments when we identify with the psalmist, it's good to come to that point where we feel abandoned. It's good to come to that point where we feel as if God's face is hidden from us. Because in coming to that point, then prayer can genuinely change your heart and your life and mine. Write down Isaiah 8, verses 16 and 17. Write down Deuteronomy chapter 32, verse 42. Turn with me to Ruth chapter 1. Ruth is one of those Examples in the Old Testament of God working outside of the nation of Israel. She was a Moabitess, and God brought her in to the covenant community. Ruth chapter 1, verses 20 and 21. And she said to them, this is Naomi speaking, this is Ruth's mother-in-law speaking. And she said to them, call me not Naomi, call me Mara. The Almighty hath dealt very bitterly with me. I went out full, and the Lord hath brought me home again empty. Why then call ye me Naomi, seeing the Lord hath testified against me, and the Almighty hath afflicted me? Naomi's what? Blaming God there. She says, I went out full, I came back empty. I went out with joy, and I'm coming back in bitterness. Have you experienced the bitterness of life? Perhaps you are now experiencing the bitterness of life. To get to the point of answered prayer, of recognizing what answered prayer look like, looks like, we have to recognize the bitterness in our own lives. The discontentment in our own lives. Lamentations chapter 2 verse 5. Prophet Jeremiah wrote Lamentations as he saw the wickedness of the people of Israel. Lamentations chapter 2 verse 5. The Lord was as an enemy. He had swallowed up Israel. He had swallowed up all her palaces. He had destroyed his strongholds and had increased in the daughter of Judah mourning and lamentation. The Lord was as an enemy. Perhaps you feel like that right now. Perhaps you feel as though the Lord is an enemy, as if the Lord is seeking to destroy and devour you. But guess what? You're at the perfect point. Because in this life, we are not promised our best life now. We are promised persecution. We're not promised ease. We're promised drought. We're not promised blessing in this life, but we're promised the curse. We're promised that we're going to have to work, we're going to, we're going to reap the fruit of the ground by the sweat of our brow. Write down Isaiah 42 verses 1 through 4, and then we, we will wrap up with Psalm 25. Psalm 25, verses 4 through 7. Okay. 
David writes, show me, thy, show me thy ways, O Lord. Teach me thy paths. Lead me in thy truth and teach me. For thou art the God of my salvation. On thee do I wait all the day. Remember, O Lord, thy tender mercies and thy loving kindnesses, for they have been ever of old. Remember not the sins of my youth, nor my transgressions according to thy mercy. Remember thou me for thy goodness sake, O Lord. He says, show me thy ways. Show me your ways, O Lord. Teach me your paths. Lead me in your truth. Teach me. Why? Because he is the God of your salvation. There is salvation in no other name but the name of Jesus. On thee do I wait all day. Are you at the point in your life where you are waiting patiently on the God of your salvation? Are you at the point in, in your life where you are asking him to show you his ways? To teach you his paths? Are you at the point in your life where you are casting your sins on him? Asking him not to remember them. Nor your transgressions. To extend mercy for his goodness sake. Do you recognize the Lord's goodness? His uprightness? Do you recognize that he is teaching you a sinner? in the way. Do you recognize that your own life is but ashes? Do you recognize that your own life is but clay? And that you are in the potter's hands all day long. Let's pray. Lord Jesus, we bow before you. We thank you for your goodness, for your grace, for your truth, Lord, we thank you for the gospel. The gospel, which is your revelation of yourself, given to us, sinful and frail. Lord, we pray that we, we would be faithful with that with which you can trust in us. In your name we pray. Amen. Amen.